Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. We got another breakdown coming at you guys. This is a BB passage. All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to get all the answers right. I'm gonna show you where to highlight, how to make details make sense, how to remember the details when the question asks for it, all that stuff. Right, I'm gonna show you how to get that 132. Before I break this down, okay, I want to plug in MCAT University real quick. Okay, MCAT University is a fully loaded program to hit your target score. It's completely new. There's nothing else like it. All right, I'm gonna make sure you get your MCAT, your MCAT score in half the time, and it's proven. Okay, you just follow a proven path. It's really easy, and you'll hit your target score without the stress and worries and low FL scores, all that. So if you're interested, go ahead, go to the comment section, click on the link, fill out an application, schedule an interview, and I'll see if you're a good fit for MCAT University, okay? Now, I'm gonna break this down. Before I break it down, I want you guys to do the passage do the passage on your own first. I can't talk today. Do the passage on your own first, answer the questions on your own first, and then resume the video. So this is the passage. Scroll down whenever you need to. It's a long passage. Wow, that's a really long passage. Okay. This is the first question, second, third, fourth. Okay. Let us begin. During normal respiration, air enters the human nose or mouth, passes through the lungs and trachea, and enters into a complex hierarchy of lung airways. All right, I'm not going to highlight anything yet. I'm only going to highlight things that I don't know, all right, and that I'm going to highlight that requires me to memorize, okay? Highlight things that you don't know and highlight things that you need to memorize. It's that simple. All right, I'm not going to highlight anything here. I know all this from content review. Most of the air inhaled ends up in the alveoli of the lung. These are very small, thin sacs at the ends of bronchioles. An adult human has roughly 50 million alveoli, 70% of which are covered in a dense meshwork of pulmonary capillaries. This close relationship between alveoli and capillaries allows for CO2 and O2 gas exchange to occur. Three types of cells make up alveoli. Type 1, squamous cells provide wall structure. Type 2, all right, great alveolar cells produce surfactant and macrophages destroy inhaled debris and pathogens. Okay, so all the information prior to this I knew already and I'm pretty confident, so I don't really need to highlight. I didn't I didn't know this. I didn't know type one and type two. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight that. While oh god, while we think of the lung as primarily responsible for gas exchange, the lung also filters small clots in the pulmonary vasculature regulates blood pH, filters micro bubbles that enter the venous system, and supplies the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. The only thing I didn't know was that it filters micro bubbles. I did not know that. Okay. Obstructive airway diseases such as asthma lead to millions of dollars in healthcare costs per year. Asthma is a disease of chronic airway inflammation, bronchial hyperreactivity, and reversible airway obstruction. Severity of the disease correlates directly with the individual's degree of hyperreactivity. Four mechanisms have been proposed to account for airway hyperresponsiveness, chronic airway inflammation. All right, so what are these the four mechanisms for higher airway hyperresponsiveness? So we have the inflammation. Abnormal autonomic regulation of airway diameter. Changes in bronchial smooth muscle function. And loss of bronchial epithelial integrity. So these are the four things that cause hyperresponsiveness. Patients with asthma have dysfunctional cellular immunity in the respiratory tract with increased levels of inflammatory mediators and allergen responsive cell types. I knew this. Let's keep going. The mechanism of airflow obstruction that leads to the symptoms of asthma has three components, bronchospasm, mucosal edema, and mucus plugging of the airway lumen. All right. That's how airflow is obstructed. Those three. All right. Excess mucus results from increased levels of inflammatory mediators. Symptoms may include wheezing, dyspnea, coughing, recruitment of accessory muscle use for deep breathing, and excess sputum production, all right? Wheezing is most likely heard during the expiratory phase of the breathing cycle, as this is when the bronchioles are most clamped down and obstructed. Tobacco smoke, infections, 
dust mites, cold air, and strenuous exercise are among the most common triggers linked to bronchial construction and inflammation. I already know all this. Diagnosing asthma requires a history of recurrent symptoms, reversible airflow obstruction, which can be demonstrated on spirometry, and exclusion of other causes of wheezing. A spirometer provides information about a patient's lung volumes and airflow rates in liters per second at various time points during inspiration and expiration. Usually, tubing is placed in a patient's mouth, and the nostrils are closed with soft clips to prevent air from leaking. The patient is asked to take the deepest breath possible, then to exhale as forcefully and quickly as possible for as long as possible. During an asthma exasperation, an asthmatic usually has a decreased force expiratory volume in the first second of expiration. Okay. Due to bronchial smooth muscle constriction and bronchial lumen congestion. All right. So FEV is the first is a second of expiration, and during that second, you have a decreased expiratory volume in asthmas, in asthma patients. Makes sense. Airway constriction and congestion also lead to air trapping, which may be visualized with radiographic, radiographic imaging. Asthmatics have a normal or only slightly lowered force vital capacity on spirometry. All right, so they have a very decreased FEV and a little low FVC. A pulmonologist maintains spirometric information before and after bronchodilator treatment to definitely diagnose, definitively diagnose asthma. Such information is shown in the charts below. We don't look at the charts. We only look at it when the question asks for it. Patients with less than 80% of the predicted value on their spirometric test likely have obstruction of their airways. So 80%. If this obstruction is reversible by smooth muscle relactants, beta agonists, okay, those are smooth muscle relactants, the diagnosis of asthma is usually made. Values of less than 60% predicted on spirometric testing are indicative of severe lung obstruction. Cool. Whew, long passage, guys. A lot of information to remember there. Okay, a lot of it's review, but there's some information you've got to know. Which of the following is the most likely value of an asthmatic FEV over FVC ratio during an asthma attack compared to normal? Equal? No. If they're equal, look, we look at the FEV and FVC to determine if someone is asthmatic. Okay, if they're having an asthma attack. All right. It's not going to be equal. It's not going to be equal to a normal person. Less than the predicted value. Yeah. An asthma attack person is going to have less um, expiratory volume than a normal person. This tells you right here. More? No. Maybe more or less than the predicted value depending on the trigger? No. You're going to have, it's going to be B. It's a pretty straightforward question, all right? An asthmatic reacting to cat dander presents at the ER and the doctor orders an inspiratory chest x-ray. Which of the following is the x-ray most likely to look like during this asthma attack? Okay, I have asthma, so I kind of can relate to this. All right. If you are looking at an inspiratory chest x-ray, you're going to have big lungs. Why? Well, you're inhaling. Your lungs expand. Okay, however, during an asthma attack, all right, it's hard to breathe out this air because your bronchioles are being constricted. All right, you have constricted bronchioles, plus you have some mucus in there. So it's hard to breathe out the air from the big lungs that we have, okay, from the uh, hyperexpanded lung volumes, okay? It's hard to breathe that air out, so we're gonna have hyperexpanded lung volumes. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Normal lung volumes? No. If it's normal, you're a normal person. You're not suffering from an asthma attack. Areas of pus derived from dead. There's not an infection, so we're not going to have the neutrophils there and bacteria. Diminished lung volumes? No. We're going to have a hyperexpanded lung volume because we have all that air in the lungs and we're trying to breathe it out. You have to force that air out when you're having an asthma attack, okay? Answer for two is A. Which of the following medications are used to treat asthma? 
All right, guys, remember the MCAT is easy. It's an easy exam. Look at these questions, guys. I'm not even struggling. This is very straightforward. Repeat, rinse, wash, repeat, rinse, wash, repeat process. All right. Let's look. They gave us medications. What did they tell us in the passage? They told us that um, obstruction is reversible by relaxants, beta agonist. Okay. Short acting beta agonist. Yes, that will treat asthma 100%. One is correct. Prednisolone, a glucorticoid. That's going to dilate your bronchioles. All right. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, you have. Um, dilation of your bronchioles why so you can so you can breathe in case you gotta fight or run okay you have the breathing ability that's why your bronchioles dilate when you have sympathetic nervous system stimulation chromonal sodium mast cell stabilizer yeah okay remember during asthma we have uh, inflammation we have a hyper reactivity there the mast cells release histamine and that's going to go ahead and induce inflammation. So we don't want inflammation. So we want that. We want to use that to treat asthma. Propranolol, long-acting beta antagonist. Okay, we want an agonist. We don't want an antagonist. Therefore, the answer is one, two, and three. D. That's how you do it, guys. It's how you make the MK easy. It's, it's easy exam. It's simple. I don't know why this is. Maybe you'll get like one, two questions that are real hard, hard, but. Other than that, it's pretty simple. Which of the following is a true statement about the diaphragm? Content review, guys. It contains both skeletal and smooth muscle cells. No, it only contains skeletal. All right, it's attached to your sternum and lower ribs. It's attached to your skeleton, your bones. Okay. Its effective neurotransmitters are norepinephrine, acetylcholine. It is innervated by the phrenic nerve, autonomic nervous system. Or receive neural signals from cerebral cortex and the brainstem. Okay. The diaphragm, it's both a voluntary and involuntary muscle. That's what's considered. Okay. Voluntary because you can move it. All right. If you want to try to move the right side of your diaphragm only without moving the left, you can do it. If you want to move your left side without moving your right, you can do it. Okay, so it's both. Also, it's happening when you're not even paying attention. So it's also involuntary. If it's norepinephrine and acetylcholine, no, I don't affect their neurotransmitters. Are they talking about the diaphragm's effectors? I don't like that. I don't have the word. That diaphragm doesn't have an effector. The effector lands in the diaphragm. And the diaphragm then contracts so this is wrong okay it is innervated by the phrenic nerve and autonomic nervous system it is innervated by the phrenic nerve but not the autonomic it's by the autonomic and the somatic all right it's voluntary and involuntary it's not just involuntary it receives neural signals from the cerebral cortex that's going to be your voluntary okay your primary somato your primary um, motor cortex is on your cerebral is in your cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe, precentral of the main gyrus there. And you have the brainstem. The brainstem is going to be in your involuntary. So you have your voluntary and your involuntary. I think I said um, gyrus. So it's actually your sulcus. Okay, your primary motor cortex is your precentral sulcus. That little lobe there. I gotta double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's that. And that's it. So, as always, guys, if you're interested in working one-on-one -on -one with me inside MK University, I will make sure that you hit your target score in half the time. And it's a simple rinse, wash, repeat process in there. There's no difference between me, you, and any other pre-med. You will hit your target score. There's no different. Simple. Plug it in. Do the MK University work, and you will see results. So if you're interested in that, click on the link in the comment section. And I can't wait to see you guys in MK University. Comment below. Subscribe, let me know how this video worked for you.